Good afternoon and welcome to the Welcome to the UI Cancer Center Community Conversations. My name is Perrin Green and I'm a men's health patient navigator with the Cancer Center. And we are also joined by Dr. Kareem Watson, the director of the Office of Community Engaged Research and Implementation Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Watson. Thank you for having me, Perrin. It's an honor to be here. And thank you to Can TV for creating this space and place for us to have these community conversations with the UI Cancer Center. Definitely, definitely. So today is our first show with the community conversation. So what we want to cover is um, just an overview and introduction of the Cancer Center. So the first question we want to ask is, if you could please provide us with an overview of the Cancer Center. Yes, I would love to provide you an overview of the Cancer Center. And also I want to say I'm here on behalf, too, of our Cancer Center Director, Dr. Robert Wynn. Um, so the UI Cancer Center is fortunate to be um, a very unique cancer center in that we're a, what we call ourselves, a community-focused cancer center. And what Dr. Wynn's vision is of us as a community-focused cancer center is a cancer center that um, meets the needs of the people by addressing various issues and various disparities. So Chicago and Illinois in and of itself is home to some of the largest cancer disparities in the country. Um, Chicago carries some of, in the top 10 rates for a lot of the cancers, including colon, um, breast, lung, prostate, and even head and neck. And these, these cancers disproportionately impact various different different communities. And as a result of us being a community-based cancer center, cancer centers by nature are, are here to focus on research and to make sure that there's clinical trials, basic and translational research that addresses various questions and various disparities in cancer, in cancer research. And as a community-based cancer center, we answer those same types of questions, but we, we try to think of ourselves as answering it from a community perspective. Who carries some of the largest rates of cancer? What, where do those communities exist? Where do those problems exist? And how can we make sure that we don't have this model of thinking of how people can get to us, but how we can take the research, the education, and the prevention to the community? Definitely, definitely. And um, you, you touched on it a little bit, but another question we want to get more in detail is, how does the UI Cancer Center differ from other cancer centers? Thank you for asking that question, Parents. So cancer centers have what we call a catchment area. And we're actually sitting in part of the UIC um, Cancer Center at UI Health um, in our catchment area is part of what we, the community call right here, the Near West community. So UIC and UI Health is fortunate to be home to the Miles Square Health Center. So the Bile Square Health Center is a group of 13 federally qualified health centers that's been around since the 1960s. We actually were the third um, FQHC that opened up in the country, and it opened up in a direct response to the war on poverty. And as a result of the war on poverty, um, in, in the area, but for a near mile, there was some of the, in Chicago, and for a near mile, there was some of the largest health disparities that existed in the country. As a result, FQHCs were created to respond to both the poverty that existed in communities, the lack of access, and the rising healthcare needs. So federally qualified health centers have been around, like I said, for decades, and we here in Chicago are proud to be home to one of the third, the third um, oldest FQHC networks in the country, Miles Square. And so you ask, Perrin, um, how does UI Cancer Center differ from other cancer centers? One of the ways we differ from other cancer centers is what we call the and conversation, right? So we do, like most traditional cancer centers, we do clinical trials, we conduct basic science research, we conduct um, population health research, we focus on education and training, and we also focus on patient navigation, screening, and education. But where we hope, where we think that we differ is in our, our model of the community. So this picture here of the Miles Square Health Center is our flagship site located at 1220 South Wood Street. And when you think about, like I said earlier, the catchment of a cancer center, who we serve, who we serve in our catchment for us is defined in our by our population that exists around the community areas where our Miles Square clinics are located. So we're located in some of the community areas in Chicago that carry some of the largest burden of cancer. We're located right, like I said, in the same the Can TV home in near west, right up the street. We're also located at a clinic in Inglewood, a clinic in South Shore a clinic in Humble Park, a clinic in Back of the Yards, and a clinic in Cicero. And then we also have five school-based clinics throughout the city of Chicago as well. Definitely, thank you so much. And um, once again, we're with Dr. Kareem Watson, Director of the Office of Community Engaged Research and Implementation Sciences, um, giving a, having a community conversation with the UI Cancer Center. 
Um, if anyone is interested in calling in and speaking to myself and Dr. Watson, please feel free to give us a call at 312-738-1060. That's 312-738-1060. And so as we were talking about how does the cancer center differ from other centers and uh, the catchment area in terms of the Mao Square, uh, Mao Square clinics, what are some of the services offered by the cancer center as well as um, we can even touch on some of the Mao Square um, clinics? That's a good question, Perrin. So like I said before, some of the services that we offer as a cancer center, cancer centers by nature are, are research centers. Mm -hmm. They're the place where we're asking the questions about what are the causes of cancer? What treatments, what are the treatments that exist for cancer that work better in some populations than others? We're asking questions of how can we prevent cancer? We're asking questions about diet and cancer, family history and cancer, um, survivorship and cancer. The, you know, what happens after those who may, may not be treatment for those cancers? What, so those are some of the services that we offer. But our office, particularly in the Cancer Center, the Office of Community Engagement Implementation Science, one of the key services that we offer is it is service the conversation we're having today, these types of community conversations. In, in our science world as a Cancer Center, we call this implementation science and dissemination research. So dissemination is nothing but disseminating or getting the information to the communities that actually can use the information the most. So that's what we call disseminating it. And so traditionally, Cancer Centers have done what we call bench to bookshelf type of research. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by bench to bookshelf type of research is that we sit in our labs, we ask our research questions, we do our research, we come up with the data, and we may publish on that data, right? And when we publish on that data, that data then goes into a journal. And then that journal is read by hopefully hundreds of our peers, um, people that have the same titles that we have, people that do the same type of work that we have. And that's important, don't get me wrong, that's very important for our peers to be able to read and review and be critical, right, mm -hmm. of the work that we do and the results that we find through our research. But the question we ask as a cancer center is, how do you get that information to the patients? So your question was, what services do we provide? One of the services that we provide is just this service we're providing today, is disseminating the research finding, disseminating information, getting the information to communities that carry some of the largest burden of disease so they can know what is the cutting edge research. They can understand what, are, what is the data saying about cancer prevention? What is the research saying about screening education? They can know when should I get screened? Who should get screened? And then also where can I get screened? And if I do have a cancer diagnosis, is it, is it possible for me to participate in a clinical research trial? And if so, why? Or what happens when I don't participate in a clinical research study? So those are some of the, the resources we offer around um, research, what we call dissemination. Again, dissemination for us is just getting the information out to the communities that carry the greatest burden of, burden of disease. Another thing we do, though, and I keep talking about this, is research. Right. We do research. Um, and a lot of communities I go into, they'll say, oh, Dr. Watson, I don't, well, I don't like research. I don't want to hear this conversation about research. I don't want to be a part of a clinical trial. I don't want to be a guinea pig. But a lot of communities use the word guinea pig. And I'm sure you've heard it in your work yeah. before, parent. But then I ask them a question. I say, um, do you know how any medication that is FDA approved, how it gets to market? And often communities will say, no, I don't know. And I'll say, any drug or device that is FDA approved gets to market, gets to the patients through a clinical trial. Every drug or device that is approved goes through the same process. And that process is a fa four phases of a process. But it looks like we have a call apparent, do we? Definitely. Let's take this call and we'll get right back to you, Dr. Watson. Okay. Yes, good evening. I have a question about um, clinical trials. I know that um, they're, they get both good uh, good news and bad raps. I know that my father, you know, um, who's dealing with um, prostate cancer right now, and we're wondering whether or not if he should get involved in a clinical trial, but he's uh, elderly, he's almost 90. But uh, does your um, uh, health center offer clinical trials, and, and, uh, and then what's your take on it's a great question. Thank you so much for that question, caller. Um, our cancer center, we do offer clinical trials, and um, we'll give you the number later on in this segment to let you know how you can find out about clinical trials. And you asked a very important question, and that question is, A, does your cancer center offer clinical trials? And the question is yes. We offer clinical trials just about for every cancer that exists, um, but we, of course, offer clinical trials for the, what we call our cancers that are often the more common cancers, and prostate, your question is specifically about prostate cancer. We do have several clinical trials that are open, uh, currently enrolling for prostate cancer. 
Now, the question that you also ask is a very important one that he, the caller asked, parent, is that would my loved one qualify? So they, every trial does have what we call criteria, inclusion and exclusion criteria. That's information that lets us know, is this study a good fit for you? And so the, for the caller, the, the information that he should know is that um, studies do have information. There, uh, there is someone called a clinical research coordinator that you can speak to to find out what are the requirements to participate in your study, how long does the study last, what are the risks and benefits, and do I qualify for that study? And often that can begin with just a simple, something as simple as a phone conversation, but it does often progress through that phone conversation to an in-person visit. And we talked a lot about research and the word clinical trials. One thing I do want to do, because we talk a lot about the um, benchmark to community model is, can we give a brief, um, simple, basic definition of clinical trials? That's a very good question, Perrin. Thank you for that. So a brief definition of clinical trials is any research question that's being asked that involves humans, that involves okay. people, right? And that involves people where you're using what we call an intervention and you're testing an intervention. That intervention may be a drug, a new pill that's taken orally, or an IV medication. That intervention may be a device. That intervention could even be a procedure. So we can do a clinical trial on a procedure, but the, the simple way to think about a clinical trial is that it's a study that's involving people that's looking at does a device, a drug, or a procedure work in certain populations to address certain conditions. Thank you. So. Yeah, that's a very good question. What is clinical trial? Because people do have misconceptions about what is clinical trial. And, and as the caller said, um, how do you know if a loved one qualifies? And every clinical trial is different. Um, even, so you can't even say that all cancer tr clinical trials that deal with prostate cancer are the same. Every clinical trial is different. For example, Perrin, you're a part of a, a study, you're over a clinical research coordinator for a study that we have going at the Cancer Center that deals with men that are newly diagnosed with prostate yeah. cancer, right? Yeah. So those are the, the study that's dealing with men that are newly diagnosed with prostate cancer that can find out, you know, is the treatment A versus treatment B, yeah. you know, the, the best option for me, right? Yeah. And also, what can I do to understand about my prostate cancer and whether it qualifies? So the best thing I can tell our audience today is that if if you or a loved one has been diagnosed with the cancer and you want to find out more about clinical trials, give our office a call at 312-996-8503. Again, that number is 312-996-8503 to find out if you or your loved one qualifies for a clinical research study. But it's, clinical research studies are also not just people who are dealing with cancer, but for currently, but for people who may be survivors of cancer, right? There's also clinical research studies looking at what questions should we be asking to talk about survivorship. So I personally was involved in a clinical trial, a research study, as the son of, of parents who were both impacted by cancer. So my mother died of breast cancer when I was seven, and my dad was diagnosed with colon cancer much mm -hmm. later on in my life when I was in, in under, undergraduate in college. So I went to a genetic counselor to find out did I need genetic testing. And then after I got that, that basic study done through genetic counseling, I was enrolled in a clinical research study that follows people who have a parent that had colon cancer to see what we should be getting done in terms of screening, education, and prevention. So the clinical research studies some mostly involve people that are dealing with the con condition, but they can also involve people that are either A, who've already had the condition and they're now what we call survivors, or those who may be at what we call high risk to talk yeah. about the issue of prevention and early detection. Thank you. And, and definitely thank you for sharing that part about your family history because one thing we do want to point out um, at the UI, can UI Cancer Center is that, you know, um, we are definitely have a passion for this type of work, but it's also affected by, you know, our family. So while we're sharing this information, we are also receivers of mm -hmm. the information as well mm -hmm. because our family and loved ones have been impacted by cancer and other health issues. Yeah, I've seen it firsthand, Perrin, um, and just a brief brief update. My, my oldest sister was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 50, um, which is technically, you know, when you, that when we're not diagnosed younger than the age of 40, you get concerned. But when my sister was diagnosed, it was because of the work that I was doing here at UIC. Mm -hmm. I was working in a program called Pen Sister, which is a community, a faith-based community program that does breast cancer screening during Mother's Day at a local church. I was working with a health ministry at a church and I was doing this program around Mother's Day and my sisters were attending because I had just graduated from UIC with my graduate degree. And through my, my own work that I was doing at the Cancer mm -hmm. Center, I was able to actually 
educate my own family and talk to them about our family history and what screenings we should be getting and what screenings especially my sister should be getting because our mother did die of breast cancer and fortunately she was able to go get screened and was then found out that she had stage one breast cancer so she caught it early and today um, six years later she's doing fine and a survivor um, and then a similar conversation I had with my oldest brother my oldest brother recently turned 50 well actually he turned 52 now and he two was having some uh, medical conditions and I had a conversation with him about you know whenever you see these types of changes or whenever you, as it's important to talk about a primary care right which I'll talk about later today but I told my brother to make sure he followed up with his primary care doctor and as a result of that follow-up he too he was diagnosed with colon cancer but again caught early and so the thing that my brother and my sister had in common was they both had really good primary care they both had access to a primary care doctor who they could have a conversation with and then they have what we call health literacy. So one of the things we hope to accomplish through these next this next series of shows on CAN TV in these community UI cancer and the community conversations is to be able to educate our, our viewers about risk, prevention, screening and access. And that's why it's really important for us to highlight the Mile Square Health Center. Because through the Mile Square Health Center, our, our listeners and our viewers are able to get a, a conversation in a primary care setting. So while we're a cancer center focused on cancer research, screening, education, and prevention, we also really stress the importance of primary care. And that's why our partnership with Mile Square is so vital because Mile Square is our primary care partner that's there before. Mm -hmm. the cancer and is there after the cancer so we don't do enough we don't have enough community conversations about primary care and the role that primary care plays in cancer prevention screening and even navigation definitely definitely and we use the word um, primary care a lot mm -hmm. so can you get once again a brief kind of definition or feeling in terms of what what does it mean to have a primary care home as well as to have an actual primary care provider? It's a good question, Perrin. Um, and in terms of what we mean by primary care is you typically have primary care doctors are usually your family practitioner, a family doctor, an uh, internist, or for women, uh, obstetrician, obstetrician and gynecologist, or, or for children, a pediatrician. Those are what, what qualifies our primary care doctors. And what we mean by that primary care is that that's your basic annual visits. That's your, your what we call your regular yearly checkups or whatever checkups your doctor has decided that he or she decided that you need because of some medical condition. But it's where you go to just get that general overview of health. And to have a primary medical home, what that means is that I have a doctor or possibly even a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant that knows me, they know my family <laughs> history, I see them at least once a year or one, you know, or however many times they say that they need to see me based on the conversation we have. And that's what we mean by that patient, that, that primary medical home. It's a place where you go to get your care that they can, what we have, we call it continuity, meaning that they know me, they know my family history, they have my medical records, and they say they can ask me questions and provide education, prevention, and screening based on my family history. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And, um, and that's great information, and we also talked a lot about, you know, being involved in the community and things like that. So for people who do similar work or even have questions about you know, having information disseminated in their community, mm -hmm. what are some tips or pointers that you may give people or who are some stakeholders mm -hmm. in the community mm -hmm. that people may go to that can assist them with dissemination of information? That's a very good question, Perrin. And um, one thing I want to say is kind of someone we, Dr. Wynn had this vision of working with our civic leaders. We, Chicago is a city of community areas, 77 community areas to be exact, right? And within those community areas, we also have wards. And those wards have political leaders. They all have aldermen or alderwoman or alder person, right? That's the leader. <laughs> so for us, we have a, a interesting take on who our stakeholder is and who our partners are. And our alderman or alderwoman is one of the people that we like to tell our community and our listeners and our patient population and our other community stakeholders who should be an advocate is your alder person, your alder man or your alder woman, because that person often is the person who's determining what resources you have in that community. If you're if that ward you live in or that community area you live in does not have 
proper primary care services or access to cancer screening prevention and education programs, a great place to start would be your alderman's office to talk to him or her about what they can do to, to make sure that the community area that you live in has the proper resources where you can get the cancer screening prevention and education. Another stakeholder is that we actually use patients as stakeholders. We utilize our patients as our stakeholders, where it'll be a mistake for me to sit as a researcher or as a public health professional to think that I know all the answers. Even with my own family history and knowing what I know, sitting on the, if you will, the patient side, it's still very important for us to work with patients, for us to have patients at the table telling us, this is how you should think about disseminating or spreading this information. This is how you should think about getting people or community interested in clinical research. So one of our stakeholders are patient. Another stakeholder is community-based organization. So we work with a lot of organizations throughout the city and the state, and then even some national, that help us get the word out. We work with the American Cancer Society, that's a known champion for cancer screening, prevention, and navigation. We work with the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force, um, and the task force is a huge advocate and a huge benefit partner for us working around um, breast cancer screening and guidelines, screening and treatment guidelines. Another advocate we work for is one of our mutual partners is Project Brotherhood, which is a men's health organization that focuses with a uh, men's health clinic that focuses on the holistic care of men, primarily men of color, but men in general who have issues of access, awareness, and health from what we call a culturally competent perspective. Um, we have tons of community partners. We partner with the Chinese American Service League, CASO, mm -hmm. another really good partner is Immigrants Angels, which is a cancer survivorship support network. Um, you name it, we have really tried to cast our net really wide in terms of our stakeholders. Cancer stakeholders are placed like Gilda's Club, um, a, a lot of different stakeholders. Absolutely, definitely. Even partnering with the Chicago Department of Public Health. So Chicago Department of Public Health just recently released it their Healthy Chicago 2.0. And so we are one of the partners in Healthy Chicago 2.0 to make sure that we work with the city to advocate for how to get information out there about cancer screening, prevention, and education. Definitely, definitely. So the cancer center is definitely in the community. We are definitely in the community. Starting we're from the bottom. Starting from the bottom, <laughs> now we're here. We're in the community at your churches. We're in the community at your faith temples. We're in the community at, we've been invited, so parent, I've been invited to, to people's men's health group at their churches. I've been invited to women's support groups at, at schools. So, and we're not just focused, and I'm happy you asked about where we are, because we're not even just where patients are. If, as, a can, as a community focused cancer center, if we go only where patients are, we miss the mark, right? Exactly. We have to go where patients, but people are not patients yet. So we're in the schools even, right? Mm -hmm. We're in the schools talking to students as early as kindergarten about things as simple as tobacco cessation, about never starting to smoke, or if they have a loved one that does smoke, how that child can serve as an advocate to help think about smoking prevention. We even do conversations around farmer's markets, because a lot of people don't understand the impact between diet, obesity, and cancer. So we have conversations in a lot of different places. Definitely, definitely. And that is good information. And we have a couple more minutes, so I want to give the number. Um, we're with Dr. Watson, Director of the Office of Community Engaged Research and Implementation Sciences. Uh, the number, if you have a question to call in, is 312-738-1060. And um, before we wrap up, I also want to give um, the number to the Cancer Center out. So if, um, if anyone is interested in having a Cancer Center come out to a mass health group, churches, barbershops, um, community organization, or any type of, you know, community health fair events, that number where the Cancer Center can be reached is 312-996-8503. That's 312-996-8503. And um, Dr. Watson, before we wrap up, are there any kind of closing remarks you'd like to give? There are some closing remarks. Um, I'm thankful for the listeners and the viewers that are watching today, and I hope you continue to join us um, each week for the next 13 weeks as we talk about um, cancer prevention, screening, and even navigation in the community. So we'll have various topics um, that center from around issues of prostate cancer. We'll be talking about prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, lots of a big conversation on lung cancer, and then also conversations on cervical cancer and head and neck. And um, diet and cancer. So lots of different conversations that will be taking place over the next 13 weeks. And you even be talking to you, bringing you back in, Aaron, and find out about the amazing work that you're doing with men's health navigation in the FQHC setting.
Definitely. And well, um, and even outside of the cancer piece, you touched, touched a couple good points. We'll also be talking about things that people may believe to actually um, produce cancer, such as diet, physical activity, things of that nature. So actually, it looks like we are um, almost out of time. So if you're interested in anything we spoke about, please give us a call at 312-996-8503. And uh, please join us next week. Thank you.